Good evening and welcome to uh, the fourth episode in our Church Family Night series. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at the letters to the churches in Revelation, and uh, tonight we're going to look at the letter to Pergamum, and that is Revelation 2, verse 12 through 17. And uh, we're going to, uh, like the other letters, uh, we're going to start uh, with a word of prayer, and then we're going to look at the typical structure. So let's go to the Lord uh, first. Heavenly Father, uh, we give thanks for the opportunity that we have to uh, come before you, to sit and to study your word and to, to see these things that you would have for us. We just pray that you would be with us uh, as we look at uh, the text as well as uh, the events that were uh, happening to your people uh, back in the apostolic times, uh, these things that they were uh, uh, encountering and uh, struggling through. Father, we pray that uh, you would show us too where uh, maybe we're struggling and encountering these sorts of things today as well, and that you would use this time to educate us, to uh, show us uh, a clearer picture of you, and to uh, bring us that much closer to you, strengthening our, strengthening our faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's look at the uh, typical letter structure uh, that we've been looking at with the letters to the churches in Revelation. And the church at Pergamum uh, has a letter that has the similar uh, U-shaped structure to the others. And uh, we see first the acknowledgement of Jesus in verse 12, uh, followed by some encouragement, uh, some what's going well in the church. Uh, and then we get to the the what needs improvement section, the sin and struggle in the church uh, section, verses 14 and 15. And then following that, then there is the call to repent of these struggles and sins. And uh, then Jesus finishes uh, the word to the church with some encouragement and a promise of salvation. And uh, again, you see this U-shaped structure where we start uh, with Jesus and then we we come down into the trough of sin, and then there's, through the call to repentance and faith, then there is a, um, a restoration, and we finish off uh, in paradise with our Lord. So, uh, again, same structure as we've been seeing in the other letters, nothing different there. So, let's continue then and discuss the city of Pergamum. Uh, sometimes it's pronounced Pergamum. Uh, Pergamum is the more common pronunciation, and I'll try and stick with that, although I may slip between the two, so I ask for your forgiveness in advance. But uh, the city of Pergamum is located uh, north of the uh, town of Smyrna, and uh, as well as Ephesus, but uh, if you can see my cursor on the screen here, Pergamum was um, about 50 miles to the north of Smyrna, and then it was also an inland city, about 10 to 15 miles from the coast. So unlike Ephesus and Smyrna, which were located on uh, the Aegean Sea and were port cities, um, Pergamum was not. It was an inland city, uh, but it also had uh, the same sorts of things. It had trade and commerce. Uh, it had been, uh, at one point, a... Um, part of a, a city-state or a kingdom, and um, was very prominent within that kingdom. And then in the year 133 BC, the, the king in that region simply bequeathed all of his uh, land and holdings uh, to the Roman Empire. So, in that, uh, at that time, it became part of the Roman Empire, was put into the uh, province of Asia, and um, over time, its prominence faded uh, as Ephesus became the, the center of the province. So, uh, in terms of its uh, population, we don't have an exact number, but we do know that it would have been similar to Smyrna and Ephesus in its size. So, it was a large city, a uh, very sophisticated city, um, and uh, it also had very uh, great location. It was built on a, a hill that was a thousand feet above all of the surrounding land. So it was fortified uh, from attack because you could see from miles around. So you had uh, that going for it, and it became a center uh, then of culture and education. It had a library that at one time had over 200,000 works. It rivaled uh, that of the library at Alexandria in Egypt, although the tradition holds that uh, when Antony and Cleopatra were um, in power uh, in that region, they took the works from the library at Pergamum and, and sent them to Alexandria to make that library much greater um, and expand 
uh, its wonder. Uh, interesting note and legend about the city of Pergamum is that uh, it's where parchment was invented. Uh, again, ties to Egypt. Uh, apparently, Egypt had banned the export of papyrus, so in order to have something to write on, the citizens of Pergamum came up with parchment. So, uh, just a fun fact for you as we uh, look at the city. Um, but along with its library and uh, its culture and education, it had uh, also a um, famous school of medicine. And we see a lot of that uh, medicine and healing tied into uh, the other part of city life in, in Pergamum, which was idol worship. Uh, it was famous for its temples and altars. It didn't just have a couple. It had four uh, gods, plus the emperor, that uh, were worshipped there. Uh, the god Zeus was worshipped there. There was a very large throne-shaped altar that was made to him. And uh, just to give you an idea of how huge this was, um, it was um, about 120 feet by 112 feet. That's the, the area. And then this entire structure was on a pedestal that was 18 foot high. So again, absolutely huge. And it was this altar or monument to Zeus. But the goddess Athena was worshipped there. Uh, the god Dionysus was worshipped there. And then the uh, chief god of the city was one known as Asclepius. And I think I pronounced that right. But... Uh, he was the chief god of the city. He was a god of healing, and uh, they had a massive healing complex. Again, I'll give you some dimensions, 425 feet by 360 foot floor plan. That's huge. Uh, and it was a healing complex dedicated to this god Asclepius. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and he was the god of healing. People came from miles around to be healed here. And uh, his uh, symbol was a serpent. So, that's very interesting. And um, so, you see, actually, the rod of Asclepius, the serpent on the pole, uh, is still used in uh, the medical profession as a symbol uh, of the trade. So, something just to keep in mind when you're looking around. Uh, because you still see this imagery today. Uh, it doesn't have necessarily the idol worship attached to it, but, but the imagery is still there, certainly. So, we have uh, this healing god that's worshipped, and he's the chief god of the city, but they also had emperor worship. So, you had the cult of Caesar in the province. Pergamum was actually the first city to build a temple to an emperor. Uh, they built a temple to Augustus, uh, as well as the spirit god, Roma. And uh, then they were also uh, blessed with a second imperial temple uh, to the emperor Trajan later on. So they had quite a bit of emperor worship going on in this city. So that, uh, again, like Smyrna, there was very loyal and entrenched emperor worship, as well as uh, these other uh, Greek gods that, and goddess that were being worshipped in the city. So that's what's going on in the city of Pergamum, and we see that uh, as far as the cities in the church that the churches to the book of, in the book of Revelation were written to, Pergamum may have been the most pagan. Uh, they had rampant idol worship. Uh, the Christians in uh, the area identified this god Asclepius with the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and. Um, one commentator points out that uh, under the Emperor Diocletian, uh, Christian stonecutters in Rome that were carving images out of uh, quarries w would have no problem carving the stone to do, you know, pillars and, and things like that, as well as even the little cupids and some of the other um, gods, the sun god and the chariot. Uh, they had no problem doing these things, but they absolutely refused to carve the uh, image of Asclepius. And uh, they were also put to death for that reason, because they refused to uh, make uh, this particular image of the serpent. And uh, they were condemned as being followers of Antipas of Pergamum. Or Pergamum. And uh, we'll see his name come up in the text. So, you had this pagan god who the Christians in the area identified 
with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So, it lends, lends to the imagery that John is using here in his letter when he talks about being the seat of Satan or the throne of Satan. Um, so, we have that. And then we also have entrenched emperor worship. And uh, the Christian church at Pergamum, we don't know uh, when they were founded. We don't know much about them in particular other than what we see in their letter in Revelation. But we do know that in this environment, they would have faced severe trials uh, from the outside. And then when we look at the text, we'll see that they had trials going on inside as well. So, that's the, the, the city and the history kind of surrounding what's happening. And uh, with that, let's move then to our text. And I'm going to give us uh, each of us a moment to get our Bibles out and to uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2, and we'll, we'll start with verse 12 here. <clears throat> Reading in Jesus' name. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and to practice sexual immorality." So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Here ends our reading of the text. So let's jump right in then, and let's start looking at what's going on in the letter. So we get to the first section, and we have the acknowledgement of Jesus. And uh, the imagery here is uh, one of the sharp two-edged sword. He identifies himself, Jesus does, as being the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. And if you go back to uh, Revelation 1, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 16, then you'll see that Jesus ha- is the one standing in the middle with the sword uh, coming out of his mouth. So, we have that. And uh, again, it's like the other letters. It identifies that what is being written is coming from Jesus. And in the case of the two-edged sword, it is the Word of God, because that's what the sword is. It's the the Word of God. And uh, we see that in uh, some of the uh, epistles. We look at the um, Uh, excuse me, the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church when he talks about the armor of God, you have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what this sword is, the Word of God, and it has two edges. And we can think of the two edges as uh, uh, law and gospel. We have the law on one side of the sword that cuts us to the heart and lays bare our sin, and then on the other side you have gospel, and you have this wonderful comfort that comes knowing that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins and that there is forgiveness for those who believe in him. And so, we have this two-edged sword, and it is the Word of God. Second, we come to our encouragement and commendation section. And we see, first of all, Jesus says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And just the acknowledgement of I know from Jesus is, is comfort, because not only does he care about, you know, the big picture, but he cares about uh, the details, too. He cares about each individual person in each of the churches that he has placed in this world. And he's comforting the church at Pergamum by saying, I know. I know where you live. And he identifies it as the place where Satan's throne is. And some take that to be the massive throne-like altar to Zeus. But there are also others who take that to be this um, uh, huge worship of the god Asclepius, who is, has the serpent as his symbol. So, there's, there's a couple of ways, but what we do know is that there was, again, rampant idol worship in the city, and uh, Satan's throne is certainly there. This is the, uh, I guess we can view this as the center of Satan's activity and persecution of the church within Asia, is what one commentator uh, says. 
and uh, we can see it in its number of cults and idols that it's got going on. But, but then in the encouragement, we see something else. We see that the church at Pergamum, Pergamum is standing strong in its faith in the midst of these things. They're not falling into um, full-blown idol worship and falling away from the church. They're standing fast in the name of Christ, at least outwardly in public. Um, they are doing that. They are holding to that which they have in Jesus Christ. That's where they're at. Um, and we see then uh, also a reference to uh, a martyr, uh, this gentleman by the name of Antipas, uh, who was a well-known martyr in Pergamum, and um, also, uh, as a side note, is the only named martyr in the entire book of Revelation. So, in a book filled with martyrdom, Antipas is the named martyr. And we see him here in our letter to the church at Pergamum. Uh, now, tradition holds that uh, Antipas was martyred uh, sometime during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian, so that would have been you know, between 81 and 96 AD, sometime in, in those years. And uh, his death would have shaken uh, those in the church at Pergamum. And if you're to believe the, um, if you're to believe the traditions about how he was martyred, it's understandable why they would have been shaken. The tradition holds that he was placed into a kettle shaped like a bull and um, roasted to death. So that's the tradition. Very graphic. And I apologize if uh, that. Uh, offends a few of you, but that's, that's how he was martyred according to the uh, tradition. And um, this death, this uh, martyrdom of Antipas would have shaken the community in the church at Pergamum. But Antipas gets a title uh, from Jesus, my faithful witness. He was faithful even to the end, so he took his faith in Jesus Christ to the grave. And to be a faithful witness is something each of us should be praying for. Each of us should seek earnestly in our daily life to be a faithful witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, that is high honor. And the church is being commended because... Uh, like Antipas, they are holding fast to that word and that truth, publicly anyway. Because as we, we move then into the sin section, or the struggle section of the letter, we then see that inside the church, all is not well. Because we see that there are uh, two uh, names put out there. There's the teaching of Balaam, and then there are the Nicolaitans. And we've talked about the Nicolaitans a bit before. Um, and their licentiousness, their license to sin, uh, or using their Christian freedom as a license to sin, is uh, tied into some of the similar things that the teaching of Balaam was, where Balaam in the Old Testament, if you look back to Numbers, and uh, it's Numbers 22 through 24, you see Balaam's story, and uh, there's a bit of a recounting of uh, what he did to the Israelites in uh, Numbers 31, verse 16, in that he counseled uh, the ruler Balak to entice the Israelites with um, their desires, in other words, into their lust, eating um, the meat, um, <clears throat> excuse me, eating the meat that was dedicated to foreign gods or sacrificed to foreign gods, and then the um, sexual immorality. And so there were some in the church who were doing these exact same things. And with the pagan culture uh, all around them, um, you can see the temptation to do these things. And the Nicolaitans were no different. And that's where the tie comes in. The Nicolaitans were using their Christian freedom as an excuse to do these things. And, and that's what was going on in the church. There's some discussion among scholars as to whether there were two groups in the church, one that specifically held to the teaching of Balaam and one that specifically held to uh, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But um, 
it really, it doesn't matter whether it was one group or two. It's the same sort of sin. It's licentiousness being carried out um, while still claiming to be a Christian. It's the trying to have the best of both worlds or serve uh, God and something else, where you're trying to please God because you're in in the faith, right, professing to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but at the same time, you are giving in to your temptation and openly sinning within the church. And the sin, the big sin in the church at Pergamum is that it tolerates false teaching and sin. They're not doing anything about it. They are openly letting it go. So, rather than exercising church discipline, rather than trying to um, bring their brothers and sisters back to a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than working uh, on the ministry of reconciliation, they have just said, you know what? It's okay. We'll let it go. And in the church today, is that a problem? Can that be a problem for us today in the church uh, of having uh, things going on within the church by members in this Christian community? And when I say church, I'm not speaking of one specific congregation, although it can certainly be happening in one specific congregation. I'm speaking of the church in general. Are we tolerating as God's church this sort of behavior? Are we allowing in our congregations these things to go on without reconciling our brothers and sisters or going to them and, and, and working to reconcile them back to Jesus Christ, bring them back to a living and restored faith. That was the sin, the big sin in the church. And we understand very well that there is no place in the church for compromising the Word of God. And that's not to say that we're not going to have disagreements or differences of opinion about things in the Word. What I'm getting at is those things that are openly sinful, those things that are absolutely false uh, and idolatry. We need to, first of all, remove these deeds and practices from the church if they've made their way in. And second of all, we need to work to reconcile our brothers and sisters who are caught up in these things, to restore them to God. That's our, that's our mission, our ministry of reconciliation. The church at Pergamum was failing to do this, and that's what Jesus is, is getting at here. And just like it would have been back then with idolatry and temptation all around in our society today. There is idolatry and temptation all around. It's everywhere you go. It's on your TVs, it's on your computers, it's on, in your, uh, um, um, what do I want to say? It's in books, it's all over the place. So, we face the same great temptation today that the church at Pergamum did 2,000 years ago. It's the exact same. And the call to us is the exact same as the call to them. That we would not tolerate these teachings in the church. And we move then into the call to repentance. And it's very simple. It's one two-word sentence. Therefore, repent. And then we have the or else that comes after it in the second sentence. You know, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So, see, that ties back then into the uh, greeting or the acknowledgement that Jesus is the one writing, the one with the two-edged sword. In other words, the one who's going to come and make war with his word is this one. So, that's Jesus who's going to come with his word, and he's going to make war. And what does that mean? Well, the sword, of course, is the word of, of God, and that's going to judge those who do not repent. You will be judged on the basis of God's Word. 
if you do not repent. And this call to repentance is not just for the people who were involved in uh, following the teachings of Balaam or uh, hanging out around the Nicolaitans and doing what the Nicolaitans do. That's not the only group that is called out here. This is the entire church at Pergamum that's being called out here. First of all, you have the ones who are following the Nicolaitans and uh, teachings of Balaam. They're called out to repent and to turn from their deeds. But the church, too, those who are not involved in these things are also called out to repent of not doing anything about it and tolerating these practices in their midst. So, the call to repentance is not just for the two groups specifically mentioned. It's for the entirety of the church either for tolerating sin or for being involved in sin. Very important that we understand that. And then finally, we move into our encouragement and our promise of salvation. So we move from the, the sin and the call to repentance. Now we're, we're into the encouragement uh, portion of the letter. And we get a lot of terms here that we'll, we'll break down mostly. We'll see. Um, so, he who has an ear, let him hear. In other words, hear and obey what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And Jesus says, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And the hidden manna is the promise of proper heavenly food as opposed to the meat offered to idols. And um, we see uh, some Christian interpreters tie this hidden manna to uh, the sacrament uh, of uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, But uh, where we can find this, then, is um, in John 6, uh, verses 31 through 35, where we see that Jesus is the manna that came down from heaven. You know, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus is the one who gives us life. Jesus is the one who gives us that manna, that that bread of life, the hidden manna. And uh, what that could be referencing is that our spiritual life is hidden with Christ in God. If you uh, look back at Colossians 3.3, it says that. So that's, that's image one that we see. And then the second thing that Jesus will do is he will give us uh, the white stone, the one who overcomes, uh, with a new name written on it. And the white stone uh, could be a couple of things. It's not known for sure what it is, but the white stone could possibly represent uh, a stone of innocence cast by a member of a jury. So if you were in a trial and uh, you were declared innocent, they had, I believe they had a white stone and a black stone. So, the white stone was the innocence stone. So, you would have a stone cast as a vote for innocence. Um, so, that's one. Uh, there's also um, the idea that the stone was given as an invitation to a banquet, which is another practice. Uh, when you wanted to invite someone, they didn't have an internet or a computer, so they could send out an evite or something. They would give you a, you know, kind of a colorful stone, and that would be what your uh, admission ticket looked like to get into an event, like a banquet. And so, when you think about the wedding feast of the Lamb, the one who overcomes shall, shall dine at that feast. And uh, so, your stone then is your admission ticket. That's another way of looking at the, the white stone that Jesus is going to give to those who to overcome. And um, it's also going to have a new name. And that new name uh, suggests a new identity, a new existence, and a new life. And that's the new life in Christ that each of us who believes in him has. That's the new life that begins at baptism. And it's, it's interesting to consider this idea of a new name In ancient times, when a king renamed something, he was claiming his ownership or dominion over it. And when Jesus gives us a new name, he's claiming that we are his. And that's a wonderful thing. So, as we uh, conclude this evening, 
we see uh, we see a, a city in Pergamum that was rampant with idol worship. We see a, a church that was beset uh, from the outside and the inside with the temptation to sin, and we see that they they were falling uh, some of them into those sins, and the church in in general was tolerating it. But we also see the promise then for the one who repents, the one who overcomes of a new identity, a new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let's now go to the Lord of prayer or with prayer, and uh, then we'll continue with our uh, group discussion. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and your truth. We simply um, ask that you would uh, continue to keep us strong in the face of temptation, that you would keep us steadfast in your word, and that we would hold to you and nothing else. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and good night.